I can throw this ball anywhere and it's going in that hoop. I don't even have to throw it at the hoop. That's right, this hoop can move in 3D to correct your lousy shot. When it's all done, this thing is gonna sync all the shots. Yes! Well, except for the ones my wife shoots. Is that supposed to happen? This hoop is the conclusion of an arms race between me and myself. It all started with a specially shaped hoop that directed lots of shots in. Then I made it move, but if you missed the backboard, it was completely useless. So I designed one that could move anywhere on a wall. But what if you totally missed the wall? It's time to move into the third dimension. Building a large, fast robot that could move anywhere in a room turned out to have some challenges. Lots of challenges. Although let's not get ahead of ourselves. The point of this robot is to impress my wife. And to do that, we need to make a system that can track a basketball as you throw it, predict where it's going to go, and then move a robot to intercept it before it hits the ground. And the main challenge is time. The ball is only in the air for a few hundred milliseconds, and this is a big robot that has to move pretty far. It also has to move in six dimensions. Wait, what? We want to be able to move and rotate it in every distinct direction. These are called degrees of freedom, although cool kids call them doffs. It would be six doff, which makes it very cool, but also very useful. If a ball is coming in like this, we need to move to intercept it, but we also need to tilt to make it go in. We could also potentially do some sweet bounce shots and other things. A really common way that I might move and rotate a hoop around in a big room like this is with a giant gantry. Basically a bunch of big old rails that can move all around like this with a really complicated cart riding on them that can rotate the hoop in any direction. It's really hard to imagine doing this at room scale though. It would be just like me before I make my New Year's resolution, heavy and floppy. The acceleration forces would make it bend like a wet noodle. Or more realistically, it would just break. It would also clothesline me all the time. It's unclear if that's a pro or con. For all those reasons, I decided that a cable actuated robot is the way to go. Imagine you have a 2D backboard with cables coming at it from all directions. By changing the lengths of these cables, you can move the backboard almost anywhere. This works the same way in 3D, it's just more complicated. It turns out you need a cable for each degree of freedom, so we're gonna need six cables. Doing this to move a backboard may seem weird, but it's perfect for this application. It's very light, which makes it a lot easier to move super fast. It's also very stiff, which means it won't flex as much under load. This is because the cables form large triangles, which are a very strong shape. We need some kind of actuator that can push and pull on a cable to make it longer and shorter. My plan is to have a motor with a pulley that can wind and unwind the cable. I ended up redesigning this three times before I got one that I thought was good enough. And it is more complicated than a motor with a pulley attached to it, which is really unfortunate because I have to make six of these. I'm gonna go make one because it will be a lot easier to explain how this thing works with a physical prototype. All right, here's your actuator. And the first thing you're gonna notice is that it's made of wood. Wood is cheap and really easy to make big stuff like this out of. This is one of the motors, and it is a little bit overpowered. This thing can put out about eight horsepower, and I have six of them, which gives me about 50 horsepower to work with. And just as a point of reference, this is 50 horsepower. It's enough power to make the backboard go about 250 miles per hour before it slams into the wall and explodes into a million pieces. And the only reason I'm using these motors is that I had them already for another project and I thought, why not? And this is the pulley that the cables wound around. They're made from the cheapest mini bike rims that money can buy. I did have to modify them and make custom hubs, but they were about 50 times cheaper than buying the material and machining them. The wire comes off the wheel and goes up into this thingy, which is very important. As the hoop is moving around, the wires constantly are changing direction, and this special little pulley will always point towards the backboard. There's a cable tensioning system built into the bottom of this pulley. These tensioners are annoyingly important. I need them because if there's any error in my calculation for how long each cable should be, it's bad. If I make the cables too long, it goes slack. And if I make them too short, it tears everything apart. So these give me some leeway. A big problem is we don't know how much each tensioner is compressed, which makes the position of the hoop indeterminate. And for now, I'm just gonna kick that problem to future me. Hey there, it's future me. He's an idiot.
Another challenge with these actuators is that if I hit the emergency stop or they lose power, the pulley is free to spin and there's nothing stopping the backboard from unspooling all the cables and slamming into the ground. This is why it has a disc brake from a bike on it. If you pull up on this little arm, it locks the brake. I made this little mechanism with a really strong spring inside of it. I can trigger it electrically and it will pull on that arm and lock everything in place. Check it out. These brakes are actually powerful enough to overpower the motors. So even if there's a software bug and it's saying, go, 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 if I hit the e-stop, it's going to stop. So I have three cables that need to come down from the ceiling. And my original plan was to bolt the motors to these trusses, but I realized that's a terrible idea. And so what I did is I have them bolted to the ground and then I have a pulley system that lets them go up the wall and over and down where they connect to the backboard, which we still need to make. We need this hoop to be as light as humanly possible. If we can cut the weight in half, it will accelerate twice as fast. I'm gonna make it out of pink foam, which is really light, but it's also not very strong. We're going to use the foam as a form to hold everything in place, and then we'll entomb it in fiberglass, which will make it very strong without adding very much weight. Here it is all put together. The cables are gonna yank on this backboard like crazy, and how they attach the foam is critical because we don't wanna just rip the anchors out. And you can kind of see through my half-hearted paint job that there's a loop of cord that goes to three anchors. When I yank on one of the anchors, the force is distributed through the cord to the other anchors. And then I have the same arrangement on the front for the other three anchors, except it's mirrored. One other important detail is that when these cables are tensioned, they're trying to pull the cord into the foam, not peel it off, which is significantly stronger. I welded up a super light aluminum rim. It isn't strong enough to dunk on, but it's like 20 times lighter than a typical strong steel rim. We just need some electronics and software and it'll be moving and grooving. So one downside of using really, really, really ridiculously overpowered motors is that I don't physically have enough power coming out of my wall for them. Well, not yet at least. This is a power distribution box and it's used to power a medium-sized construction site or in this case, a medium-sized basketball hoop. You feed it with a generator or another high power source and it'll split that up into a bunch of independent outputs. Just look at the plug on this thing. It is a beast but it actually doesn't have enough power to run all the motors at 50 horsepower. And I think that's fine because if I did, I would just tear everything apart. It's kind of like having a fast car. You're never gonna go fast, but you could if you wanted to, and that makes you cool. So before we can start moving motors and breaking stuff, we need a little bit more electronics. We need something that can send the commands to the motors so that they'll actually move and also orchestrate the motion of the various motors so that they move in unison. To do that, we're gonna use a little computer called a microcontroller. It'll be wired to every motor and it'll tell them how much and what direction to rotate. Figuring out where each motor needs to go will be done by another computer running the Big Boss program. Big Boss will do this by listening to a tracking system which will tell it where everything is located. When it sees a ball, it'll predict where it's going and how the hoop needs to move to intercept it. Then it'll tell the microcontroller, also known as Little Boss, how much to move the motors so that that actually happens. I have the electrical schematic done. All it does is it allows the microcontroller to connect to the motors and tell them how to rotate and also for it to command the brakes to brake. It still has a ton of connections though. Each of these blue lines is actually a wire, and if I tried to wire this all up by hand, it would be a nightmare and I would get it wrong. So what we're gonna do instead is make a circuit board that will have all these wires inside of it, and all I have to do is connect the various chips to it, and it should work. And because I want it now, we're gonna machine it. Turns out this is pretty dumb. I don't know what I did wrong, but this circuit board is just the worst. I keep ripping traces off and it is driving me crazy. So I was looking online and I can get one of these boards made tomorrow for $50 or I can get five of them made tomorrow for $50. So if you do the math, that's actually $10 for a board. How does that make any sense? Come on, the more you spend, the more you save. He says that every time he gets a tool. I can't afford not to. All right. Hopefully I don't need the backups. They cost $10 each. We just need about a thousand feet of cable. Oh, come on, it's not that bad. All right, let's try to move some stuff. I don't know which motor is which. Uh -huh. 
Sweet. All right, so amazingly this worked on the first try. When I tell a motor to move to a specific spot, it does, and the backboard flops around like a dead fish. And that's all I can do right now. We need the Big Boss program to figure out how to move the motors. But before it can do that, it needs to know where everything is. In the past, I've used a Microsoft Connect and some pretty involved algorithms to figure out where the ball is. It reminded me of trying to start a fire with one of these things. You can do it, but it's a pain in the butt. Come on! And this is ridiculous. It's 2022. We have technology. <coughs> in other words, it's time to stop tracking objects like cavemen. If you look closely, I have eight of these cameras mounted all around the room. It's an OptiTrack camera system, which really accurately tracks the location of reflective objects. It can track objects 10 times faster than the Kinect with about 100 times the accuracy. I put reflective stickers all over the ball, which should be super visible to the tracking cameras. They'll figure out exactly where these stickers are in space, which they'll send to Big Boss, which will then figure out where the center of the ball is, and that's all there is to it. Excuse me, sir, do you have any comment? That was easy. The tracking cameras work by sending a snapshot where everything is at a moment in time. They might say that the basketball is here, and then four milliseconds later, it's here. If you collect a bunch of these points and connect them, they give you the path that the ball has taken over time. The Big Boss program is going to take all these points and perform a little simulation to predict where it thinks the ball is going to go in the future. It's trickier than you might think, though. The computer just sees a bunch of places that the ball is. It doesn't know if it's in my hand or in the air. And the last thing I wanted to do is lock onto my hand and reverse dunk the ball at 70 miles an hour. So what we have to do is take all this information coming in on where the ball's going and classify it as in my hand or in the air so that we do the right thing. If you didn't notice, this is a giant mess. We're going to use the fact that things flying through the air follow parabolic paths. Let's say these are the locations of the ball. We can tell that it's flying here, but the computer can't. So here's what it does. It draws a little line between each pair of adjacent points. Each of these lines is going to be at some angle. If we measure the angle for every line and graph it, it's going to give us some shape. If our shape is a parabola, it'll be a straight line. If it isn't, it'll be something else. We can use this fact to pick out when the ball might be in the air. And this is where it gets really cool. This line is at some angle, which depends on the shape of the parabola. If the parabola that resulted in this line was generated by Earth's gravitational pull, the slope of this line will be equal to the gravitational constant for Earth. So if the computer sees a straight line and the slope spits out gravity, we can be quite sure that the ball is flying through the air. If you're curious and you want to learn more, this is an application of calculus, specifically the first and second derivative. Now the question is how the backboard should move to sync the shot. It could swish the ball here. It could do a backboard bounce. It could do a fancy backboard bounce. It could do this. In fact, there's infinite possibilities. We're going to use a strategy that just looks at some of these and chooses one that's good enough. We start by looking at where the ball will be a tiny bit in the future. And we calculate the best swish and the best bounce. This is done with a bit of linear algebra. If you want to learn more, check out my previous basketball videos. Once we have those, we repeat this over and over again for every inch that the ball is going to travel. This gives us a big set of possible ways we can make the ball go in. Although some of them are impossible, either because the hoop can't move there fast enough or because it's an impossible position. The rest are all fair game, so I just pick one. All of that takes about a thousandth of a second, and we're doing this continuously, hundreds of times per second until we figure out where we want to go. But even once we're moving, we're still getting more information on where everything is. So we can use that to refine our prediction of where the basketball is going. And also if the backboard is going to exactly the right spot. Because remember, the tensioners can make it not go exactly where we want it to go. So the big boss is constantly comparing where things are versus where it thinks they should be. And if they're not quite right, it'll tweak them so they line up. We're almost there, but we can't quite throw the ball yet. The computer calculations are saying if we move the hoop to this spot in space, it'll intercept the ball. But to actually make it move to that specific spot, we have to make all these cables the right length. And figuring out what they should be is called inverse kinematics. And for a robot like this, it's actually really simple. If we know where we want the backboard to be, and we know the coordinates of the anchor pulleys, the length for each cable is just the distance between the anchor pulley and where it attaches on the backboard. That's literally all there is to it. The problem I'm having is actually a very practical problem, which is that I don't know where the pulleys are located in space. If I don't have accurate measurements for this, my inverse kinematic calculations are gonna be wrong. A tape measure isn't accurate enough. 
I also can't use the tracking cameras for this because the pulleys are too far apart to fit in the field of view of the cameras. So unfortunately, we're gonna have to make a special tool and write a little bit more code. This is the tracking stick. It has markers that the tracking system can track and it's designed to attach to one of the cables. If we pull this cable really tight, it's gonna form a line straight towards the pulley. And we can measure that line using the little tool that we just made. The only question is where on this line is the pulley located? So what we can do is we can move this all around and measure a bunch of lines that are all pointing towards the pulley. And then theoretically, the pulley is located at the intersection of all these lines. Unfortunately, reality kind of sucks and none of the lines that we just measured are probably gonna intersect with each other. And that's because there's a little bit of error in all the measurements that I take. So we're gonna have to do a little bit more math and programming to figure out the best approximation of where the pulley is from all this data. We start by taking all of the rays and choosing a random point as a terrible guess for the intersection of all the rays. We calculate how far this point is from every ray and add that up. We want the computer to figure out where to move this point to make this number as small as possible. Our strategy to do this is to move the dot a little bit in all three directions and calculate how this number changes. And then we'll use this information to move the point in the direction that will most reduce the number. If you do this a bunch of times, the point will move until it can't get any smaller. And this is a good approximation for the intersection of all the rays. We just have to do that for every pulley and bam, we got all their locations. This technique is called gradient descent. You may have seen me use it in some other projects. It's very useful, especially in machine learning. All right, here we go. It's the moment of truth. I've been waiting so long to try this. my brakes don't work. I need to fix those and probably about a thousand other things, but before I do, the ball is not tracking well. Sometimes the trajectories just don't make sense, and it doesn't matter how many problems I fix. If I'm putting bad trajectory data in, this just won't do the right thing. I really didn't want to change the basketball, so I've been trying to fix this in software. I've done regressions and outlier ejection and tuning the camera system. I got it better, but not good enough. So time for a Hail Mary or whatever the equivalent of that would be in basketball. My thought is that I should just use the tracking markers that I use for everything else because I know that they work, but you can't really just attach those to a ball and expect it to still be a basketball. But if I put them inside the basketball so they're not sticking out, it basically would work. If you're wondering how I cut a pocket into a basketball, I have a solid foam ball that you can cut stuff into and it won't just explode like an inflated ball. I need these pockets to be pretty precise, so I think cutting them out with a CNC machine is the way to go, but this ball is super soft, and I think the CNC machine will just push into the ball rather than cutting it. But I think I know the answer, and it's awesome. <coughs> Plastics and rubbers get harder when they get colder. Who's there? This should keep it from deforming. This is not a machining operation that I ever foresaw myself doing. I've still got 99 problems, but this ball ain't one because this thing is awesome. The tracking is excellent and most of the volume is still a basketball, so I think it still counts. Unfortunately, nothing else works. Here's a taste of two weeks of my life. Something that shouldn't happen, happened. I wonder why that is. Ugh, I basically told it to. Does it work now? I'll take that as a no. Why isn't anything happening? All right, I think I got it. Why would it do that? I guess technically my code said to do that. What's the deal with that? You know, let's spend a week trying to make it not do that. I think you get the drill. Oh, gosh. It just occurred to me how dangerous this is. It's so fast that I don't know that you could dodge it if it went for your face. So I'm just gonna disable it from going below head height that way I don't have to worry about it one hit KOing my wife. In the long run, I'll probably make some kind of tracker so it knows where everyone is, and then it just won't go within a certain distance of any of the people in the court. I've probably said this 50 times at this point, but I think I finally got it working. Let's see what this thing can do. Oh 
goodness. <laughs> I think that's the coolest thing I've ever seen. All right, let's try that again. Look how good I am at soccer. Again. Oh. Oh. We have a little setback. I ripped one of the anchors off the wall and destroyed it, but I don't care at all. This thing totally works. We're gonna get the wife in here and we're gonna see what she thinks. This is the cheap ball, this is the wife ball. If you throw this one, you're really good. And if you throw this one, you're not as good. Wow, this is elaborate. You wanna try it? Yeah, I do. All right, fire it well. So fast. So if you think that's cool, try doing it over your shoulder. Oh, is that supposed to happen? So it went in and then the hoop is so fast it zooms away and unswishes it. That's pretty cool actually. It's supposed to be a prank, but I don't even know if that counts. It is really yeah. cool in summer. You demand, you demand, you demand. Is that going? All joking aside, this thing is super fun though. Rebound. Backwards blindfolded wife. Oh, you stink. Oh yeah. Top of the forklift. Nice. Time to go home there, ball. <laughs> yes. It's literally more impressive if you miss. Natural, <laughs> okay. Natural talent. Natural talent. So what do you think of my hoop? I think it's a good thing you have it because you can't throw a basketball, clearly. It's so fast. The crazy thing is it can go like 10 times faster. Really? It is a kid in high school who never applied themselves, operating at a few percent of its potential. So it's you? Basically. It, it's got some issues that are limiting it. Don't we all? I think it can go so fast that I could score a basket, then as the ball is falling down, it could come and then score another basket before the ball hits the ground. That would be really cool. I might have to do that. It'd be cool to see you on this versus a pro. I thought about doing that, but I need a bigger room. My forklift is in the way. My forklift's in the way. I don't have a big enough room. Whoa. Got too much cool stuff in the way. Just need a bigger oh. space. Oh. Obviously. Oh. It's been two years since I made the first moving basketball hoop. Ever since, I've known a 3D hoop is the right answer. I've been putting it off for all this time because I knew it was gonna cost a fortune. So, to all the people who have supported me in all the different ways, I wanted to say thank you. I'm finally able to make this awesome hoop, and it's just the beginning. I want to make the biggest, craziest things that you've ever seen. So if that sounds interesting to you, please consider supporting these videos. You can join my Patreon, you can get a t-shirt, or you can check out this video sponsor, KiwiCo. And if you didn't notice, I'm at the beach, which means KiwiCo crates for everyone. Inside each crate is a project with everything you need to do it. You tell KiwiCo your age and interest, and they send you a new crate every month. For example, I told them my nephew's 14, and he's interested in engineering. Kids love these because they're fun, but I love these because hands-on projects like this build intuition and skill that's just going to snowball into future abilities. I know this because I grew up with kids just like these, and look at me now. 
They really do have something for everyone. So if this sounds interesting, go to kiwico.com slash stuff made here and you'll get 50% off your first month. And that's it. Thanks KiwiCo for sponsoring this video and thank you for taking a minute to listen to the sponsor. You're 14, right? No, <laughs> I'm six. That's <laughs> fine. This project has been a long time coming. I have been talking about this thing since... Forever. Yeah, forever. And it's also been a long time since my last project. Part of that is that this project took forever, but also I've been putting a lot of time into another project. I'll probably share more details on that when I get further along, and until I make this thing do some crazier stuff, it's pretty much all I got. I hope you enjoyed this project, and thanks for watching. All right, see ya. <laughs> Cut.